On a snowy winter day with beautiful stars in the sky, there is a castle with a garbage container beneath it. Something began to move under the trash. Suddenly, a hand emerged from underneath. There is a star that does not shine at the top peaks of the night sky, but hangs in the trenches where no one looks. At that moment, a boy comes out of the trenches holding a sword while kneeling. The star is still a star even if it's from the trenches if it wishes to shine and still embraces light in its heart. A blonde man stands in front of the inn. A man stares at the long sword on the side of the inn. No matter how many times he looks at it, it remains magnificent. When someone says they knew he would be here again, that's when the man turns his head and sees Zamina, a girl with red hair and crossed arms. Zamina calls Vlad out for being out of touch recently. Vlad tells her not to bother him because this is one of the few breaks he gets. Zamina asks as if that's everything because that's why people start rumors about him. Vlad, unknowingly, asks about the rumors circulating about him. Zamina shakes her head and asks him if he still hears voices when he picks up a stick or something. While Vlad can't find anything to say, Zamina asks him about the sins he committed in his past life. Who would expect to be struck by lightning on a clear day? Black lightning at that too. Zamina raises her finger and lectures him that he should have stayed in the shop for a while. They also say that the new bishop is sensitive about signs and things. The bishop worked as an inquisitor in heresy, so if he saw someone suspicious, he'd send them straight to the stake to burn. Vlad asks her why she had to tell him something like this. Zimina tells him she's just worried about him. Zimina realizes they are in a dangerous situation, reminding Vlad that many people saw him struck by lightning. Everyone is already talking behind his back, so he must stop standing out as he used to, wondering what if the church took him. Vlad explains to her that he won't be dragged away just by staring at the sword for a moment. Zamina reminds him of his foolishness and tells him to buy the sword if he really wants it. When Vlad tells Zamina it's too expensive, she begins to wonder how expensive it could be. It's just a sword from a back alley blacksmith. She asks about its price and whether she should buy it for him. Vlad slowly reveals that it costs five gold coins. Zamina asks what in the hell for that stupid piece of metal. With that amount of money, Vlad knows he wouldn't need to work for a whole year. The blacksmith comes out of the inn and repeats the part. Zamina said, stupid piece of metal. The old blacksmith starts running towards them, addressing them as little children and asks them to get out of his sight. This weapon wasn't made for back alley kids like them. Zimina stands her ground and asks who would buy it then. It's being sold in the poor districts. So who but someone from the poor districts would see it and buy it? She asks the old man if he has lost his mind. The old man gets angry for being addressed as an old man and asks them if they don't know any manners. Zemina provokes him further, asking why he is making all this fuss about making a sword that only knights will use. Has his time come or what? The old man angrily yells in her face that this is why because his time on this earth is nearly over. He asks her why she doesn't just go back to her shop and wash the dishes, immature child. Zamina wonders what he said to her, declaring herself as a mature lady. That's when Vlad puts his hand on her head telling her not to get worked up about this and tells the old man they will be leaving. As they turn their backs and start walking away, Zamina tells him to leave her be as she didn't say anything wrong. When the old man hears this, he yells at her to stop it. The old man watches them walking away and calls Zemina full of poison. He remembers a memory from the past when Vlad, Zemina, and another man were hiding under an outside shelter covered with a blanket, and the old man brought them a lot of food back then. He turns his back and calls her cursed, even if he didn't really mean it. As he turns his back, he notices something. Realizing that Vlad had been standing here for a while, the ground all dug up, he grumbles that he should be focusing on trying to make a living instead. The old man holds the sword and talks about Vlad's ambition. It's going to be harder for him if children develop dreams in a place like this. He knows well that a child from the poor neighborhoods never escapes them, so he will sell this to someone who can get out of the poor neighborhoods. He cannot allow his last work to rot in a place like this. The old man looks at the glowing sword, realizing that it is just like him, remembering Vlad where both of them shine in such a place the economic center of the north, the beacon of the northern region, thanks to the power of the Bazid family. Sura, for a place like this, it's natural to embrace dark shadows, the poor neighborhoods where all sorts of dirty and smelly things are thrown. We enter a tavern with people talking and men enjoying the company of women. A woman screams, while a man grabs her by her hair, accusing her of being stupid enough to try to deceive him as he drags her behind him on the ground. She asks how she tried to deceive him. The man angrily tells her that he has been a mercenary for 20 years. How dare she try to sell him fake medicine? Vlad, who is passing by, knows that things never calm down here. When the man sees Vlad, he calls him the candle maker, 
realizing the timing is right, and tells Vlad to bring the lady. Vlad reveals to him that he needs to pay in gold coins, not silver, to meet the lady. The man screams at him about how they dare ask for gold for such work, telling him to bring his mother if the lady isn't here. This provokes Vlad's nerves, but he remains calm and does not respond to the man's provocation. The man begins to question about the candle that measures time. It was a trick, wasn't it? Why then did it burn out completely before he could do anything? Vlad asks him how he wanted to enjoy a session that lasts only five minutes anyway, telling him to massage his wife's rear if he doesn't have money. The man is very angry at Vlad for what he said. Vlad, who doesn't buy this, asks him if they should check whether the candles last five minutes, asking if he sees the clock there, let's see if it lasts five minutes or not. Vlad promises that if it doesn't last five minutes, he can do anything with that woman. The man wonders why he should listen to a bunch of fraudsters. Vlad, angrily, tells him he said, Let's do it, but if it lasts five minutes, he will beat him to death. The man starts sweating when he sees Vlad's eyes, feeling completely exhausted in front of him. Vlad grabs a match and places a candle on the ground, asking who the fraudster here is. Vlad lights the candle, and now they wait. The entire tavern watches this spectacle unfold. Vlad watches the candle, which has stopped burning. The man turns to see the time on the clock in total panic because he doesn't remember what time it was at that moment. At that moment, Vlad hits his face with a wooden stick, knocking him back. Vlad tells him it was five minutes and calls him a son of a… then kicks him into a separate room. Vlad closes the door behind him telling him he's a dead man. The man tries to stop him, but his efforts are futile. Vlad tells him that he's the one who tried to deceive them. What kind of mercenary is this fat and says, bring my mother. You should be more considerate of people without mothers, as he hits him. People outside can hear the man's screams as Vlad tells him to be quiet. We get another beautiful day as Vlad tries to have his breakfast, revealing that someone tampered with the candle. It wasn't five minutes. Do you understand what I'm saying? He talks to George that someone tampered with their candles. The lady screams, wondering who dares to tamper with their precious candles. GL tells her they'll have to find out. The lady agrees, of course, and orders him to search for the culprit. Vlad wonders how he's supposed to find the culprit while the lady tells him she's already found them. Vlad, surprised, asks who it is. Rose smiles. Lady Marcella tells him it was her. She wanted to deceive those drunkards and get more money. Vlad doesn't say anything because he was speechless walking in the inn staircase wondering if he beat that man for no reason, leaving it as it is. What could he do as a regular employee anyway? A man standing around the corner tells Vlad he's proud of him for what he did yesterday. A group behind the man asks if something happened while he was away. He approaches Vlad and tells him they need some money now, and he knows he got some tips for selling candles yesterday because they're all broke. Vlad, angry, asks Burley what they're trying to do. Everyone is scared and tells Vlad to let go of the tension. Burley tells him that he's not just asking him to give him the money, but it will be a fair exchange. Vlad, not knowing, asks what kind of exchange. Burley tells him that if he gives him some change, he has something to give him in return, a small black boy he's holding by the hair, a stupid and unskilled pickpocket. You know him, don't you? Burley says to Vlad he'll give him back the boy for 40 silver, which is a very good deal. Vlad is very angry, but holds himself back and asks about the boy's ankles and wrists. Burley tells him he wouldn't have called him if he had already cut them off. He just taught him a light lesson, describing him as really fresh. Vlad takes out the money bag and drops it on the ground. Burley, happy that he can rely on him before they leave, tells Vlad that next time they should kill them instead of looking for him, which terrifies the small boy completely. Burley tells him not to be like that. They're gang members, not murderers. Vlad knows the truth and tells them they're deceiving their family and their co-worker. When the group is away from Vlad, Burley tells the rest of the group, I told you, because Vlad has control over the stray children. Vlad, with a serious look in his eyes, calls the boy by his name, Ned. Ned, still scared, apologizes to Vlad. He just tried to play it safe, but things didn't go as planned. Vlad, without responding to his excuses, asks if any of his bones are broken. Ned quietly says no. Vlad tells him if that's the case, then he should leave now before he breaks some. As Ned leaves, smiling, he thanks Vlad for saving him. Well. There goes Vlad's five gold target. We move to the harbor, where a man sits in the cabin of his boat, saying that the boy was very lucky not to have lost any of his fingers or anything. We learn that the speaking man is a whale hunter, the captain of the Hoover family, named Harvin. Cut fingers, cut ankles, he ended up being a public lesson for everyone, all in the past, while he was lying on the ground and Vlad and Zamina were trying to help him. Harvin asks Vlad about the candle tampering. Vlad is surprised because he already knows. 
Harvin tells him it's been a while since the rumors spread, but no one seemed to believe them. Madame makes the candles, but Marcel isn't that kind of person, as you know. Vlad knows all this and says that George seemed to know too. They are not that kind of people. If they did, there must be a good reason for lying about it, claiming it was Madame. Vlad wonders what kind of reason it might be. Harvin has an answer. A great chance they need the money, urgent money, for something, warning Vlad to be careful. There's only one reason an organization might try to raise money quickly. War against another organization. Five bosses dominate the poor districts of Sora. Knight George, the Pig Butcher, the Black Bear, the Dice Gambler, the Whale Hunter, Captain Hoover, and finally, the Money Lover, One-Armed Jack. All life's darkness approaches you, hiding in the shadows, silently, just like now. As Vlad sells candles, a huge man with one arm approaches him, bypassing the queue, asking Vlad about his boss. Vlad realizes it's one-armed Jack, and that accidents happen without warning, and destruction occurs without notice. Vlad wonders why the money enthusiast came personally, realizing this is the preparation for the war he discussed with Harvin. Vlad's thoughts are interrupted by the money enthusiast yelling in his face, asking if he hadn't heard the money enthusiast's question about where Vlad's boss is. Vlad frowns at them, telling them how is he supposed to know, as he is just a candle seller so he doesn't know. The money enthusiast gets angry, calling Vlad a little scoundrel, and knocks the candle box over, telling him that if he doesn't know he should go and find out. They look at each other as candles fall to the ground from the shock of the punch on the table all the candles hitting the ground and the entire inn watching the situation unfold. Women, men, and Zamena were completely surprised by what just happened. Vlad kneels down with his sticks and starts collecting the broken candles, talking about how all these expensive candles are now broken. No more sales for today. The man standing over him talks about how this little one doesn't understand the situation. His speech is cut off by Vlad asking him to move his feet. The man, disgusted, asks what he said. Vlad repeats himself that he told him to move his feet. This angers the man so much that he goes to hit Vlad while calling him a scoundrel. The fight is a miniature representation of the war when the kick is about to hit Vlad, the intended battlefield, the planned circumstances. Vlad grabs his stick and strikes his leg, blocking the kick. The man jumps back. This is when Vlad prepares and drives his stick, hitting the man directly on the chin, hammering him. Only with boldness and determination is victory ensured. Men, women, and the money enthusiast stay speechless, watching what just happened. This is when Vlad looks at his enemy, the unchanged base of the back alley. The winner stands tall above him with a stick beside his head and the loser below. The money enthusiast's men start to reach for their weapons, wondering how he dares to do that in front of them. Money Bug stops them with his hook, chewing the hook in front of his men so they don't advance. He really starts to admire Vlad. He has only one arm, so he hopes Vlad would be more understanding of the fuss. Vlad tells him that he doesn't discriminate against the disabled. The money enthusiast enjoying this admires him more and calls him crazy. But their mood suddenly changes when he approaches Vlad and tells him they should have a private chat. Later, the money enthusiast asks Vlad about the person who took him back then. Vlad tells him that since he doesn't remember, they probably died early. Suddenly, their conversation is interrupted. When the money enthusiast notices and asks what's going on here, it's Vlad's boss, George, telling the money enthusiast that if he had announced himself earlier, he would have prepared roasted meat for him. The money enthusiast tells him to stop. It's not as if they were close to each other in that way. George asks if they should move upstairs since there are many guests. Moneybug agrees but wants to skip the meat, asking if he has any good drink. George tells him that Marcel is not the type to disappoint when it comes to showing hospitality. The money enthusiast accepts the offer, so let's taste it then. They start moving upstairs and Vlad can finally relax, realizing he almost died here. After collecting all the candles from the ground, Vlad wonders how many candles were broken. He is dubbed the Rising Star by Money Lover who tells him that his boss has not skimped on compliments about him. He prides himself on being a good judge of character, telling Vlad that when he gets tired of the smell of burning to come work for him, as he wouldn't mind having a young man like him around. Vlad tells him he doesn't mind working here, as they feed him, pay him, and allow him to sleep, which Money Lover finds amusing and starts laughing, telling him they could do that for him too. He snaps his fingers and sends a gold coin Vlad's way, saying, it's for the candles. When Vlad catches it, he notices it's a gold coin, telling him that's a lot of money. Money Lover reveals that if he worked for him, he would give him as many of those as he wanted. After all, his name is Money Lover. Money Lover and his group shout that it was delicious, and they are leaving. Vlad watches them and sees Money Lover looking happy, wondering if things went well. Meanwhile, Zamina calls him from upstairs, saying that George is calling him. 
They sit next to each other at the bar with Maricela in front of them and the rest of the gang around them. Vlad, without words, just looks at something George gives him, a dagger. George was planning to give this to him later, but circumstances require him to pass it earlier, telling Vlad to keep it on him at all times. Vlad can tell from the mood of the room, staring at people's faces, that George and Jack's conversation with one arm was a disaster. George tells Vlad to stop selling candles from now on. Vlad asks what he is supposed to do instead, collect money, patrol the area. George reveals that they have information that Jack with the one arm is bringing in people from the outside who appear to be mercenaries that were once knights. Vlad wonders if they are mercenaries like George. George tells him he is right with a worried look on his face. Jack with the one arm has led a huge number of men, but even for Jack, the former knight, George was a tough obstacle to overcome with numbers alone. After all, a flock of sheep cannot face a wolf, but by bringing in swordsmen on the same level as a knight, this balance is destroyed. George realizes they are in an unfavorable position, telling Vlad that's why they need him. Vlad wonders if George heard correctly. George tells him he will give him his first mission very soon, putting Vlad on alert. Yet, he thinks of Harvin, a disabled man without fingers and even without the ability to walk, who with his sharp intellect taught himself language and mathematics, and using that now works under the command of Captain Hoover. Seeing Harvin, Vlad realizes something, that you learn through effort and learning takes you to higher places. While he was suddenly waving his wooden stick, Vlad hears an unknown voice in his head, advising him to narrow the angle of his elbows while swinging down leaving Vlad speechless. Vlad, annoyed, complains about this happening whenever he swings. A month ago, Vlad started hearing a voice after being struck by dark black lightning. Those demonic whispers start whenever he holds a sword or anything similar. So annoyed by this, he declares he needs holy water before being a sword. He shakes his heed telling himself to ignore it. The more he responds to it, the more it sticks to him, as they say. So, he focuses on the thing in front of him, telling himself to do his best concentrating all his mind and strength and striking down. That's when he opens his eyes and hears a voice telling him to narrow it after he strikes down. The look on his face tells the story. It was different this time. He realized that earlier he was just waving, but now it was more like a sword's path, feeling more connected to the strike. There is also a man covered in shadows holding a sword. Vlad starts to wonder what has found its way into his head. Closely at Vlad's features, like the blonde hair and blue eyes, he can't ignore the feeling that people might think he is noble. Vlad does not respond, and only hands him a sealed letter, informing him that it is from his boss. He takes it and starts reading it, and after finishing, he understands why he was summoned. The opposition organization had hired mercenaries who were formerly knights, and so Jorge needs his help. Vlad does not ask any questions, informing the man that he will lead the way, and they must arrive by night within two days. Vlad turns his back, and Stanja wonders about his behavior, unsure if he really should follow someone foolish. Vlad tells him that he is at least capable of guiding, wondering if he wasn't qualified. Stanja only tells him that he doesn't think so. He acts more threateningly and tells Vlad that there's no way he is smart while doing something very stupid. Vlad immediately becomes more alert to the situation. Stanja tells Vlad that if he says this is not the way while they are walking, he will kill him. Vlad looks at him and turns his back, telling him to make sure to keep up because Vlad does not want to fail in his first mission as well. Stanja wonders why Vlad acts so boldly. He made himself appear threatening to Vlad on purpose, but all he did was ignore him. He smiles and realizes that this is why Jorge likes him so much, a child worthy of being nurtured strongly. On a winter night, Vlad and Stanja sit in a cave while the wood crackles as it burns, and Vlad looks at him. When Stanja notices Vlad looking at him, he asks Vlad why he keeps staring at him, wondering if this is the first time he has seen a retired knight. Vlad reveals that from a close distance, this is indeed the first time he has seen a knight. Stanja asks Vlad if he is a villager instead of answering. Vlad asks where he comes from. When Stanja says Dieya, Vlad jokingly tells him that place is rural too, just as he is a villager. Stanja finds it a little funny but doesn't show it outwardly, telling Vlad that he should not lose the way for if he does, he will cut him in half. As Vlad opens his dried beef, he tells Stanja not to say scary things. Vlad had heard in the past that jokes made by knights should be taken seriously. Stanja becomes more interested when he sees the dried beef, admiring how tender it is, wondering if Vlad also has his share. Vlad reveals to him that Jorge did not pack more for him, wondering if he did not have anything to eat. Stanja tells him he does, while looking at his own dried beef disappointedly. When Vlad grills the dried beef over the fire, 
That's when he realizes how good it smells. Finding innocence, Vlad asks if he does not have something to ask him. Vlad notices the change in behavior and asks him directly why the suit didn't change. Stanya tells him he will answer one question for one piece of dried beef, commenting that this is a great opportunity that doesn't come often. Vlad remains silent for a second, then asks him how much he wants, saying that if he just wanted some, he should ask him next time, telling him that as a knight he carries pride, knights receive things when they give something in return. Vlad tells him he is retired, but he tells Vlad that he followed this belief to this day. Vlad starts asking questions with just one word like his name and age. He tells him his name is Stanja and that he is 42 years old, but he feels slightly annoyed by Vlad's short questions. That's when Vlad asks if he perhaps knows how to use the aura. He realizes that upon closer inspection, he is only innocent on the outside, revealing to Vlad that not all knights can use the aura after all. Using the aura in a real fight is something else entirely. Vlad, tired of not getting his answer, directly asks if he can use it or not. Stanja remains secretive, revealing nothing. This is when Vlad realizes his strongest weapon, taking all the dried beef and telling him to take it all. After that, Stanja begins to stand up, telling Vlad that a knight should only receive the things he has given in return. Well, there are times he does what he wants, but he has been eating dried beef only in the past few days. So there's that. When he draws his sword, Vlad's eyes widen, wondering if he can really see it. Stanja stands straight, lifting his sword to the middle of his body, closing his left eye. Vlad, wondering why, asks him. Stanja tells him that he needs to summon his world from the depths of his soul. The blue energy gathers in his left eye, telling Vlad to watch carefully. The blue energy wraps around the sword, and this is the essence of the knights. He opens his left eye, and suddenly a burst of energy is released. Vlad watches this, witnessing the aura for the first time in his life with Stanja standing before him and his sword wrapped in blue essence. When we reach the outskirts of the poor districts, Vlad and Stanja appear on the inside of the wall with Stanja feeling disgusted like a vagrant. Vlad tells him it's better to be a bit dirty because in the poor districts it's better to look like a vagrant than a knight. Stanja, still upset, tells him he's not talking about his appearance but rather his mood. He has his pride as a knight, wondering why he needs to go through that hole. Vlad tells him he was told to escort him from there secretly so they couldn't go through the main gate. Stone silent so he doesn't argue with him. Vlad tells him to move and that he will prepare him a bath upon their arrival. As they pass through the streets, they were completely deserted. Stanja tells him the silence is unsettling. Vlad tells him that's because it's that time of the night. Both become alert immediately when they notice something. Stanya asks him if this place is usually like this. Vlad, with a frightened look on his face, tells him this is not the case. They look at the scene in front of them, and there are dead people on the right and left. Vlad tells Stanya that they should split up, and he will tell him where the back door of the organization is, known only to its members. Stanya asks him what he will do. Vlad starts running, telling him that he will now go through the main gate. It's better for them to divide their attention, promising Stanya that he will see him later. Vlad arrives in front of the main door, covered in blood and gasping after running. He opens the door and sees everything in chaos, welcomed by George, who tells him he did well to arrive safely. He sits on a chair while Marcel treats his wounds, all wrapped in bandages. George reveals that the financial leeches attacked them first, as expected. Those who deal with money are on another level compared to others. Vlad, with a worried look on his face, asks if it was all right while a dead man is lying in the corner. George tells Vlad that it's been a while since he faced someone on a knight's level, so he ended up like this. More importantly, George asks him if he brought him. Vlad tells him that he did bring him, but they split up because the main gate was under surveillance, so he told him about the back door, and he should have arrived by now. George, pleased with the news, reveals that they will attack the financial leeches tomorrow. Tomorrow, we will finish things this time. Then he asks Vlad about the condition of the mercenary. He's all right, isn't he? Vlad tells him that he's fine and seems like a good person too. George tells Vlad that Stanja has a solid side to him. Vlad remembers Stanja's moves and tells him that he is very agile too. George wonders if he lost weight because he remembers him being fat. Well, to live a long life, you need to take care of yourself. Vlad reveals that he is also a knight who can use aura, claiming that he is sure that tomorrow will be their day. George suddenly looks at him with a terrified look and asks him what he just said. Vlad hears footsteps. 
realizing that he is probably here now. George interrupts his thoughts and asks him if he really used Aura. Vlad tells him that Stanja showed it to him. George quickly grabs his sword, telling Vlad to take cover behind him, because Stanja does not know how to use the Aura. Vlad becomes terrified, and while asking Jorg what he means, his speech is cut off by Stanja entering the door. Stanja enters the door, covered in blood and holding his sword, telling George that he came from afar. He smiles with a blood-covered face and tells George that it's been a long time. A man wipes his blood-stained sword with a handkerchief, claiming that no one can cheat his age, expecting that the winter winds might have crept into his bones. He is a man who claims to be Stanga, looking over his shoulder as he walks away. We see a broken sword covered in blood on the ground next to a lifeless arm. It's very plausible to cheat age, but are you just a fool? Or was it intentional with the real Stanga's lifeless body lying on the ground? After that, we return to the end where Jory and the Trickster stand face to face. The Trickster tells Jory that he has changed a lot since the last time. Jory, clearly exhausted, asks him why he came looking for him now of all times, revealing that Count Gar has died, leaving Jorge completely stunned. He starts pouring wine into his cup, telling Jorge that it hasn't been announced yet due to some complications, but soon everyone will know about it. They look at each other, but Jorge is the only one who shows a look of horror on his face. The trickster raises his cup of wine and toasts to the unfortunate Count Gar, provoking Jorge, who rushes forward, calling him a son of continuing to speak as Jorge is about to hit him. Jorge strikes, shattering the glass and everything in his path, but after a second, everyone falls silent when they notice that the trickster has dodged the attack and is now behind Jorge, praising the rays of the new Count Gar named Sigmet. After that, Jorge attacks again, crying out his name Godin, and their swords collide, creating an impact, both standing strong trying to break each other. This is when Godin tells Jorge that he has been ordered to immediately bring back the fugitive known as K in Jorge. This is the first order of Count Sigmund. When Jorge learns of this, he screams at him, saying that Sig is not his lord. Godin reveals that Count Sigmund does not expect his return obediently and does not hope for it either. Everything flies in the inn as they break their deadlock, jumping in different directions. But as soon as they land, they attack each other again, countering each other's attacks. Vlad tells Marcella that the situation here is dangerous and helps her out, guiding her out of the room. Once they are out, the assembly members scream at Vlad, wondering what is happening there. Vlad tells them to bring everyone here immediately as he was about to reveal to them what is happening. But he is interrupted by Jorge's body flying out of the room past him, leaving everyone in shock as he falls to the ground outside the inn. Godin finishes his attack, telling Jorge that he is still making the same naive choices as before. Jorge falls to the ground, leaving himself completely exposed, everyone wondering what is happening, but there is no time for explanations. Jorge coughs while Godin looks at him from the upper floor. In that moment, Vlad's dagger is on its way to strike Godin, who notices it just in time and deflects it with his sword. Both stand and look at each other. Godin jumps down from the upper floor, attempting to finish the mission. Vlad screams at Kuri to get out of the way. Kuri struggles to rise from the ground at the last moment, and as Godin is about to strike, he moves aside and dodges the attack, leaving Kuri kneeling on the ground. Godin asks him why he did not follow orders that day, to which Kuri tells him that he is human and does not follow orders like dogs. Godin angrily tells him no, that he is a knight. Kuri shows a look of despair on his face with a man behind him. Godin looks at them and tells them that the night has been too long, closes his left eye, and reveals that he just wants to rest now. Vlad runs down the stairs from the upper floor of the inn when he notices what is about to happen as Godin uses the aura. Vlad screams helplessly at them, but it is too late. Godin opens his left eye with a blue essence. Vlad tries to stop him by screaming not to do it. Then visible lines appear across everyone's bodies and finally even across Kuri. At that moment, Godin advances advances, swinging his sword, cutting everyone in his line of sight, leaving Vlad blinded by the blue essence that cuts even the entire building with a glowing blue essence. Everything is in ruins, with Vlad alone, kneeling, looking around, confused about what just happened. As he slightly opens his eyes more, he sees everyone dead on the ground, severed. In anger, he bites his lips, suddenly noticing movement. He turns his head to see a man standing over Kuri's head. He was about to call Kuri's name happily when he realizes what is happening, with blood dripping on the ground. The unfolding scene is a harsh embodiment of betrayal, loss, and the ultimate consequences of the ongoing conflicts between the characters. Godin, who seemed only to want rest, takes a radical action that leads to widespread destruction, pushing the story towards a dramatic turning point. Vlad, shocked and shattered by the loss of his comrades and the chaos unfolding around him, 
finds himself facing the harsh new reality left behind by Godin. This moment leaves the reader with many questions about what will happen next. How will Vlad deal with this immense loss? What are Godin's true motives behind his recent actions? And how will this event affect the larger conflict surrounding the characters and their world? This turn of events demonstrates the novel's strength in exploring human emotions and moral complexities in the face of conflict and betrayal. The characters are pushed to their limits, revealing their true nature and setting the stage for future developments in the story. A look of horror appeared on his face. He remembered the time when Jorge was the first to offer a helping hand to a boy tumbling in the dirt of a back alley, the first to acknowledge him, the strongest person among all those the boy had seen. We see that it is Godin with Jorge's head severed from his body. The calm blue moonlight approaching shattered the little boy's world into pieces when he saw Jorge's head in Godin's arms. He grabs Jorge's sword and rushes towards Godin with an anger he had never felt before. And just as he was about to deliver a blow to Godin, suddenly a voice screams to stop. He attacks Godin, who barely dodges the attack, leaving Godin in shock as he sees the path of the sword attack, wondering how the alley child knows the sword's path, considering it impressive. Vlad doesn't listen. Controlled by anger, he rushes forward, screaming in his face to die. That's when Godin kicks him in his stomach, sending him flying across the inn, thinking in his head that it was with him, unbelievably, even instinctively twisting his body and blocking the kick. The voice inside Vlad's head tells him to breathe, prompting him not to give up. With Vlad struggling to get up from the ground after the kick, Godin knows that cutting off this emerging prospect now is a great waste, even if he comes back in the future with someone's sword. He remembers a memory from the past where Jorge was teaching him the path of the sword, saying that watching those with potential is always a pleasure. Godin smiles and addresses Vlad as a child who came to him, just takes a knight a fair price. Vlad is still on the ground in pain, asking what he means. When Godin tells him that he is not Stanga and not 42, he got an unfair price from him and drops bacon on him returning it. Yet he will take Jorge's head, considering it a suitable price and is right as today's winner. They look at each other with Vlad telling him that he will kill him. Godin just turns away, telling him that with his life as it is now, not even to think of asking for the second price for the bacon. Vlad clenches his teeth, screaming as Godin leaves that he will kill him, telling him over and over again as he leaves the door, just waiting for him to kill him with a desperate look on his face. It's midnight in the slums. Zamina holds on to Vlad as they walk in the middle of the road. Vlad holds his ribs, still hurting from the kick he received from Jodan. As they walk, Vlad suddenly feels a sharp pain in his ribs again, falling to his knees with a pained cry, remembering the time at the inn he was still hurting from the kick with his head down. But Marcial returned to the inn after Jodan left, telling Vlad to get up, repeating it, and asking him if he wants to die here. Vlad, with an empty look in his eyes, seems to want to give up on life. Marcial gets angry and frustrated with Vlad's behavior, decides to slap him to snap him out of it, telling him to pull himself together, asking him if he knows the difference between the men who live in the city center and them, the losers in the slums. She continues to explain that it's an opportunity. Vlad starts to grasp reality again. Marcielle explains that those men can get up again. Even if they fail once, they can bear it. But what about us? With a view of everyone from the society dead after Jotun's attack, she tells Vlad to look around. This is the result of just one failure. Failure once for people from the slums means death, the fate they are unfortunately bound to. Marcielle holds him and tells him not to miss this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to live again. This is when Vlad comes back to reality after falling to the ground in the middle of the street. Zamina worried about him asks if he's okay and also if she should slow down. Vlad insists telling her to keep walking with a determined look in his eyes, claiming he can't end things here. That's when suddenly, a man at the end of the street screams that he found him saying, the little slave of Jorge is here. Zamina and Vlad immediately realize the weight of the situation and start running again with a group of men carrying swords chasing them. Their nest destroyed, and even if they were just small birds, it was time for them to fly in the sky on their own as they run from members of the opposing organization. After a while, they manage to escape leaving all the members searching for them in the streets wondering where they went and if they went this way, cursing them and asking themselves if they didn't turn into another alley. One of the men orders the group to search every existing corner, promising to reward them generously if they found them. It's the man from Jack's group with one arm who got beaten by Vlad at the inn, promising that he will make Vlad pay for the shame he made him feel. The rest of the group starts running and searching every corner, while the group leader tells them to split up as he couldn't have gone far. We see wooden doors and men running while Vlad and Zemina listen from behind the door, hearing the men running from their hiding place. Vlad realizes they won't be able 
unable to escape at this pace. The opposition organization controls the streets, making it much harder to leave now. Vlad tells Zemina to come back when things calm down, but she refuses, asking about him. Vlad knows he needs to find a way out of here somehow after surviving so far. This can't stop him. Hearing them, he knows they are close and it's dangerous for them to move together. Zemina, scared, screams saying she wants to stay with him. Vlad argues that she promised Marciella she would only help him get to a good enough place and then leave, telling her to go to the monastery before sunrise or to Harvin. That's when she screams, saying she doesn't want that. Vlad gets angry because he wants to protect Zemina, telling her she really isn't listening, calling her stupid and asking if he looks like he can protect her now. Zemina, about to cry, tries to tell him, but suddenly their conversation is interrupted by a voice asking who's there. They both are startled by the voice. That's when Zemina sees a knife on the table and grabs it. A man with a lamp covered in shadows enters the room, recognizing the two with Zemina holding the knife in front of her. It's the blacksmith, and when he recognizes them, he asks why they are here. Zemina, nervous, screams at him not to move, still holding the knife threateningly. The blacksmith makes an annoyed face, wondering what's wrong with her since they are the ones intruding on his home. She screams at him not to move, promising she will really stab him if he does. They all look at each other, with Zemina having tears in her eyes. After the looks, the blacksmith understands the situation, telling her to put down the weapon. She insists through her teeth, telling him to give her the sword while raising the knife higher. The old man is speechless and asks what she means. She tells him about the sword that was hanging, saying it's not safe outside the city either, so it would be useful for Vlad in the end, telling him she's not joking and to give it to her, leaving Vlad surprised. He tells her to put it down, but all she does is scream to bring the sword. The blacksmith, after some time, realizes once again that this is how the poor live, the real characters of people who need to take from others to survive. Realizing he was once like that, guessing now it's her turn, he tells her that all this is sad, so she becomes very frustrated, plunges the knife, and screams. Vlad screams at her to stop her from attacking the blacksmith, while the old man closes his eyes expecting his end. And when she plunges the knife, we see a look of shock on Vlad's face. Instead of attacking the old man, Zemina cuts her hair with the knife. The old man opens his eyes, completely surprised. Zemina, crying, tells him that she knows this won't be enough, but she will make sure to make it up to him later. She swears to make it up, spreading her hair and pleading with him to please give the sword to Vlad with most of her hair falling to the ground. The old man looks at him and asks Vlad if he intends to leave. Vlad, determined to seize this opportunity, tells him yes. The old man remembers the one thing he couldn't do despite dreaming about it all his life, realizing this young man is the one who will achieve it. His wings haven't spread yet. The old man holds his heed, saying they surely make things difficult for him. He turns around, telling them to follow him. We move to see a cart leaving the city loaded with garbage, with the old man pulling it from behind and Zemina at the back pushing it, telling him it smells, to which he just tells her to keep pushing, because this is the only way. Suddenly someone calls out to the old man. A group of men from the opposing organization approaches him, asking what he is doing here at this late hour. When he sees them, he wonders if these bastards are here too. One of the men comes in front of him, asking if he is throwing away the trash at this time. The old man puts on a loud display, yelling at them that you bastards have blocked all the alleys with your damn stupid fighting. His forge is about to explode because of all the trash he hasn't been able to get rid of yet. The man complains about his attitude when he notices someone at the back of the cart wondering who this is at the back, asking if he works alone. He yells at them again that he was too tired to do this by himself, so he gave some bread to the slave to do the work instead, asking them if they want to push it instead. The man tells him it's okay since he is the only blacksmith around, but he needs to check the identity of the person covered with the blanket, so he puts his blade under the cover, saying not to move unless they want to cut something. When he lifts the cover cutting it, everyone is left in shock, pretending to be a man saying it's really hard to make a living this way. The man disgustedly just says, pass on, so the old man continues to ask what they are really looking for. The man explains they are looking for George's blonde child because they couldn't find his body. The old man turns his cart and asks if they can leave now, but the man doesn't let them pass that easily. There's something else they need to make sure of. One of his men calls out, the scoundrel, demanding to search the wagon. That's when Vlad, who was hiding under the garbage becomes nervous. Both Zemina and the old man realize this could be the end, but they tell him not to do it here and to move the wagon over there. The old man now wonders if they should go somewhere else, but knows there was no other option available to them. The man notices the amount of garbage brought, but also that the woman pushing the cart at the back is Zemina. She turns her head, but the man says nothing, loudly stating they shouldn't hate him as this is just his job. He pokes the garbage with his spear. Zemina covers her face in fear while the shocked old man waits to see if the man hit him. In 
Instead, he tells them he heard that Harvin put a boat in the river. Both are shocked that the man struck once and instead told them information, his spear beside Vlad's head. He continues telling them everyone went that way, thinking there must be a reason why that fool did it. Keep this in mind. He removes his spear, telling his group the way is clear. The old man turns around, and as he's about to start moving, the man who was inspecting the cart tells them this is the 40 silver payment his brother owed to Vlad. Vlad inside the cart realizes his luck and thanks Otter for saving his life. As they part ways, they finally reach their destination. Standing in front of the massive gate before the large garbage pit leading out of the city, Zamina bids farewell to Vlad, wishing him safety. He is pushed with the cart through the hole out of the city. The star the boy held in his hand was something the old man made with his dreams but with the girl's tears now falls onto the garbage outside the city. On a beautiful winter night with the moon out, Vlad sits by the fire looking at the sword, and as he looks at the blade, he asks if it can hear him. Out of nowhere, a voice tells him yes. The distressed Vlad asks who it is, but the voice doesn't identify itself. Vlad tells it he had much to say about swords, but now he doesn't even know who he is. The voice stays silent because it truly doesn't know. Vlad tells it that maybe it's for the best, promising to help it, but asking for the same in return. Vlad promises to help it regain its memories, but in return to be his sword, no matter if it's a demon or not, what he really fears is being nothing. With a determined look on his face to improve, while the voice inside him hears this, it promises to tell him about his sword. In the snow-covered mountains, there is a prepared camp with war flags of some kingdom hanging outside one of the tents. Inside the tent, a man sits moving strategic pieces on a map, claiming that the path to victory is very easy. He is the second son of the Bezid family, Joseph Bezid, with a troubled look on his face. He looks at it repeatedly, searching for traps, because everything seems too easy. A man arrives at his tent, informing him that he has returned from his journey and addressing him as Young Master Joseph. Relieved by his return, Joseph calls the man by his name, Gear, a tall swordsman with a bandage covering his left eye. He tells him that he seems as if something is bothering him, asking if he is worried about something. The young master reveals to him that the reason is that everything seems too easy. Gear tells him that the mission to eliminate the monsters is going smoothly, the number of victims is low, and they are all mercenaries. The young master Master asks him if the escapees or the missing people as a result without any VAR abilities or escapees are not considered, believing that everyone will doubt his ability to lead. His father and followers are taken for granted, but there is also Rieger, his older brother, from another mother. Joseph realizes the gravity of the situation while knowing that at this rate it would be disastrous if he could not become the next count. It's clear what Rieger would do. The Bezid family, which glorifies the military, is evidence it in written history. Joseph's father and his blued brothers trample it on each other to obtain the Count's position, realizing that his biggest weakness is the lack of swordsmen except for Rieger. That's when Rieger reveals that besides his return, he has something else to inform him about. Joseph was not expecting this and asks him to tell him. Rieger reveals to him that there seems to be a suspicious soldier wandering around. The young master wonders if it's a spy sent by his brother. Rieger tells him that this is not the reason for his suspicion, informing him that he will understand once he sees for himself. There is a goblin corpse hanging with fatal wounds from sword strikes across its body. Body. Joseph remained stunned by how horrific the scene was, looking at the goblin corpses alongside Gear and noticing that what happened was done by a child who had just begun using a sword. Rieger leads him to another body and tells him to look at it too. They pass by the hanging goblin corpses, but Joseph still notices that the wounds are very weak. They move past all the bodies, but the wounds do not change at all. After a while, the wounds begin to improve one after another. That's when Joseph realizes that they are the same marks but different, telling Gear not to reveal to him that this was done done by one person, suddenly asking if all this was done by one person with a backyard full of goblin corpses. Gear confirms his guess, all this was done by one person. The last one arrived yesterday, and the first was done just a month ago, leaving him speechless, thinking that it is impossible to achieve such improvement in just one month. Joseph seized this opportunity, turning around to ask Rieger who he was. It was a beautiful winter day with blood flying everywhere, goblins dying left and right, screaming in pain. A group of men fought the goblins, using various weapons. One of the men screamed, demanding to tighten the ranks so the goblins couldn't escape. One of them stabbed a goblin with his spear. Finally seeing an end to this screaming, enjoying it and telling the other men to start working on getting rid of the rest. Suddenly, the expressions on all the men's faces changed before they could even make a sound. A hobgoblin appears behind a man holding the spear just as he was about to ask what was happening. He gets crushed by the hobgoblin's club weapon, waving it and creating a huge shockwave, killing the man and leaving the rest of the group in complete horror. That's when he screams and moves 
moves forward, leaving the mercenaries in shock, angrily advancing and crushing some of them. They were all in a state of panic, wondering where that monster came from. One of them orders the rest to retreat as it broke through the fifth rank. That's when a man on a horse arrives, asking them what they are doing, ordering them to hurry up and move forward, asking how they plan to get compensated when they run away. The mercenaries scream at him that they hadn't heard there were hobgoblins, telling him he should have hired more expensive mercenaries instead or fought himself. He draws his sword, swearing at them, when the body of one of the mercenaries falls in front of him, thrown there by the hobgoblin who had decapitated him. He begins to tremble with fear, realizing he might die here, then sheathes his sword and sits on his horse when someone arrives, leaving a trail of footsteps in the snow with a sword behind his back and blonde hair as he heads towards the hobgoblin. A group of mercenaries wonders about his identity. Some of them recognize him, naming him Raymond. That's when more men recognize him and call him by his title, Raymond the Fasting. He advances, drawing his sword, telling the men that he will take care of it, moving quickly, making enough noise for the hobgoblin to notice, who turns but too little too late, as Vlad was about to deliver a blow with his sword, cutting across his stomach and moving behind him. He screams in pain, but Vlad knows it it was just a superficial. Suddenly, an inner voice screams at him to dodge. As the hobgoblin swings towards him with its club right beside his head, he jumps aside, dodging the attack, sliding on the snow trying to slow down the momentum from the jump. He gets angry at himself for failing again. The inner voice tells him he's stupid for not being able to do it even when it told him how. Vlad makes a funny expression, telling himself he would be considered a genius if he could do it after being just told. But loudly, he tells the voice that he's just taking the long way. The hobgoblin approaches him swinging its club from left to right, from right to left, trying to hit Vlad, but all he does is dodge all the attacks even with the club barely close to his head. This infuriates the hobgoblin, so it lifts its weapon and is about to smash it down, leaving a large smoky trail after the collision. After the smoke clears, we see that it struck the ground only, with no one around. That's when the hobgoblin realizes it's about to face its end with Vlad behind its back. He tells himself that this time he will truly cut it. The hobgoblin is about to turn to defend itself, but it's too late as Vlad is already swinging. That's when Georgier tells the young lord the name of the man standing behind the goblins. It's the fasting Raymond. When the young lord learns this, he orders Georgier to investigate him immediately. Georgier agrees and accepts the order from the young lord. Joseph, still looking at the goblin's corpse, thinks it's meaningless, pondering these twisted and reckless strikes. To think that one person could take the path of the sword in just one month. He smiles when he realizes that he might have caught a big fish that could prove to be useful in the future. That's when Vlad finishes his swing, cutting the hobgoblin's head. Joseph goes to call him a genius if he managed to achieve such significant improvement in just one month. The mercenaries clean up after their hunt, loading the ghouls onto wagons and everyone searches the ghouls and their camps. They thought there might be something good because of the hobgoblins, but they find nothing in the end. A man calls calls out to Vlad, the leader, telling him he was great this time, too. Vlad tells him to stop blabbering and make sure his kills are loaded. He responds, telling him that he has already done so, wondering who would dare touch what is his anyway. As they are about to finish subduing the beasts, the man wonders what they will do now, asking if Vlad wants to do another job with him. Vlad interrupts him as he talks about how far they can go with his mind and Vlad's sword skill, telling him he doesn't believe in working with swindlers. The man, taken aback by these words, falls silent for a second, then suddenly mentions a mercenary board that surprises Vlad, making him turn around. He knows Vlad can't continue using the mercenary board, telling him he knows someone very skilled in forgery. His speech is cut off by Vlad calling him by his name, Gerda. Gerda looks over his shoulder, telling him he should know that gossip can kill people. He thinks if it was just a suggestion, he would warn him, but if it was a threat, he would kill him, leaving Gerda silent from fear. After coming to from his shock, he apologizes, telling Vlad he was saying that for his own good. It's unfortunate that he earned so little while being so good. Vlad, angrily, tells him to shut up and continue cleaning, or he will lose his head. Gerda, frightened, does not take his chances and prefers to leave Vlad alone. Vlad thinks he will have to do something about him at some point. He turns around, and while the rest of the men load the ghouls, he goes into the forest. The rest of the mercenaries notice this and wonder among themselves if Raymond will pray again, admiring his steadfastness. He kneels among the trees holding his sword. The mercenaries around him comment on how amazing he is, thinking he might really be noble, acknowledging that he couldn't have been born in the same class as them. Vlad kneeling is angry with himself for not being able to finish it in one strike. An inner voice tells him he's a fool and that the principle of one strike, one kill, lies in the element of surprise. Vlad wonders what that even means in his head. The voice tells him 
him that when he raises his sword and the opponent goes whoosh, that's the time he should go wham. Vlad wonders if he's supposed to understand that. The voice asks why he doesn't get it. It's simple. Go wham when they go whoosh, leaving Vlad desperately just repeating whoosh and wham. Some mercenaries gather behind him and pray with him as he repeats the same words over and over. Back at the camp, everyone has hot soup on the table. Vlad looks at it, wondering what kind of meat is in it. Gera tells him he doesn't know, but it's free, so why care? Telling Vlad that it's really hard to find a place that provides meals for workers with the rest of the table, telling him they're working for the Basidines, after all. Another man complains it's too salty, but better than nothing. Vlad stands up, leaving the table, and tells the others to enjoy their meal as he walks away. The rest of the table wonders if he's going to see the priest again, pondering if they should start praying when Gera tells them they'll never be like him. Vlad enters the priest's tent, and the priest notices him and welcomes him. Vlad asks Father Andreas if he had slept well. He tells him he did, as always, reminding him how he heard that he was praying last night, admitting how cold the weather had been. Ramirez recalls last night, when he was out all night practicing the curses Woosh and Wam, but he tells the father how he could feel cold when in the arms of God. The father laughs, telling him he is more of a priest than he is. A young boy enters the scene, informing the father that the meal is ready. The father thanks him and sits down. Vlad asks him to join him for the breakfast he's about to have. Even after Vlad protests that he is not here to eat, he is only interrupted by the father who sits and tells them to pray. Vlad and the young boy pray, thanking the Lord for this meal, asking for strength from this meal to help them do good for others. This is when the father opens his left eye and looks at Vlad, praising him as a true believer who, even in the midst of such a humble place, has not lost his faith telling himself that he needs his leadership, the leadership of this young man who will always bloody his hands in battles. This, too, must be a faith entrusted to him by God. After finishing the prayer, he tells Vlad to eat. Vlad looks at the food filled with joy, rare wheat bread and soup. This is real food. As he is about to eat, the father starts asking him about his sword skills. He has heard a lot about them, but it seems Sir Joseph has heard about them too. And Sir Gare came to see him two days ago to ask about Vlad. The father stops talking as he asks what happened next, after telling him that he had recommended him, saying to Sir Gare that he looks forward to seeing him grow. This puts Vlad in a state of high alert as the father continues to explain that the House of Bet is a famous family from the north. Just being able to work for them would put him in a much better environment, telling him that he deserves it. He leaves again for the four forest, realizing that this is not good at all, guessing that it was too obvious. The voice tells him that they had no choice, as sword skills could only be learned through real experience, wondering if getting too close to the priest was the bigger problem. That's when Vlad tells the voice that he had to check. The voice asks him if he is finally sure that it is not an evil entity. Father Andreas is said to be a reputable person with great divine power, strong enough to be offered the title of bishop, and since he seemed not to notice anything strange about him, Vlad is now sure that the voice is not an evil entity. Anyway, he asks if they should flee. The voice tells him they might overlook his false identity since he is skilled enough. Vlad realizes that they will eventually discover that he killed a mercenary who was stealing. Then he will be accused of identity forgery as well as murder. The voice mocks him by saying he is a very evil man. Vlad makes a funny face, telling him that he is also an accomplice, holding his sword tightly while while the voice tells him it would be better for him to run, as self-defense claims only work when one has a witness, and he does not have one. Knowing this, he decides to escape tonight. If they take Gera with them, they could even get a fake board. Suddenly, the voice tells him that he thinks this plan might prove difficult. Surprising Vlad, the voice reveals to him that someone is approaching, and that he is at least an advanced knight. He raises his sword and turns around. It is Gwerger, and they both just exchange glances. Gwerger wonders if he felt his presence, admitting that he might be better than expected, telling him that that Sir Joseph wants to see him. Vlad realizes the gravity of the situation, thinking that he should have run away directly instead of waiting until night, telling himself that he must act now or he will be in big trouble. So Vlad greets Gwerger respectfully, knowing somewhere that poker face is an undeniable skill. Gwerger asks him if he knew he was coming. Vlad tells him he heard it from the father, although he did not think he would come this quickly. Gwerger is surprised that a little boy like him is not intimidated by him at all, turns around him and tells him to come with him as he turns his back. Vlad automatically asks himself if he should try to escape now. The voice quickly brings him back to reality, telling him not to even try that. A knight of his level could kill him before he could take three steps. That's how strong he is. Realizing he has no choice, he sheathes his sword and follows Gwerger. They arrive at Sir Joseph's tent, who welcomes Vlad when they finally meet. Vlad bows, telling him it is an honor for him. Sir Joseph continues by asking him if there were any obstacles in his work. Vlad tells him everyone here is fine, thanking him for his consideration. Joseph wonders aloud, describing Vlad's features like blonde hair and blue eyes, telling him he thought he was the son of a fallen noble family. 
asking him if his name was Ryman. Vlad, still with his head bowed, confirms that. Joseph closes the book he was holding, telling him he should have said this earlier. Gwerger slaps Vlad, and both look at each other fiercely. Joseph tells him he really hates liars as he looks at Vlad, addressing him by his real name, Vlad from Sura. Vlad, injured, realizes that he knew everything about his situation. Joseph tells him that it was confirmed Vlad's mother was an unmarried woman, but they couldn't find any information about his father. Joseph threatens Vlad, asking if he knows by chance who his father is. Vlad takes the situation seriously, telling him it's very funny to ask a son of an unmarried woman about his father. Because of this, Gerger kicks him from behind in the leg, making him fall to the ground and warns him to remember his manners. Vlad remains silent to avoid more trouble. Joseph steps forward, telling Jer to stop because it was very funny as well, revealing they already know why he ran away from Sora. He becomes serious and asks where he learned to use a sword. Vlad steps stays silent because he's unsure of what to say. That's when Joseph looks at him, knowing those eyes hide a lot. That's when Gare comes up behind him, brandishing his sword. This puts Vlad on immediate alert. He bites his lip and tells them he had a teacher who came and disappeared like lightning. Joseph listens carefully as he wasn't expecting this at all. Vlad continues to explain that he never revealed his name, only telling him a secret that should never be revealed to anyone because it's an unwinnable secret. Joseph sees his steady gaze, possibly telling the truth, telling him he's sorry for the rough treatment. Vlad, happy that he's not asking more questions, wonders if his plan worked. Joseph continues saying he might not be aware, but he's in a very difficult position, offering him a proposal. Vlad from Sora, don't you want to rise to a higher place? I mean things like power, freedom, survival, and chivalry. Telling him that he, as Joseph Baz, would like to support him. We move on and see wooden swords clashing. It's Gerger and Vlad training, with a group of mercenaries around them. They discuss their training with each other, some thinking Vlad is holding up well, while others know Gerger is being lenient with him, wondering if he will become Sir Ger's disciple. They notice he's exceptionally skilled and lucky to be prepared for a prosperous future. Again, Vlad parries a strike from Gerger, calling Vlad an arrogant scoundrel, asking how he dares to raise a his head high in front of Sir Joseph with such basic skills, striking and telling him he doesn't know his place. Vlad feels the power behind the strike, realizing he is at a different level. If he dodged it, Gerger would immediately follow it up, and it would be too strong for him to block this time. Vlad strikes downward but finally figures out what to do, angling his sword in such a way that the strike slides off, causing his sword to drop. He quickly finds his opportunity, moving and raising his sword for a strike. Gerger recovers just in time and blocks his sword. The mercenaries around them, surprised, find it impressive that he managed to find a way to attack Gerger, pleased that he should at least manage this much. Vlad knows he didn't actually succeed as Gerger simply allowed him to land a strike. That's when Gerger surprises Vlad, telling him they will train like this twice a day, in the morning and in the evening. Vlad wonders if doing something like this twice a day is a good idea, but says nothing. Gerger turns his back after finishing the morning training, telling him not to cool down too much. Vlad watches him leave, thinking about how unhelpful he is, not giving him a single piece of advice. That's when the voice tells him that his sword skill was notable, cutting ruthlessly all of Vlad's excess movements telling him that getting hit is how one learns. Vlad is annoyed that no matter where he turns, no one is by his side. Back in the tents, Sir Joseph asks Gerger about his opinion after seeing him for himself, telling him that he can be used. He's at a point where even the Count would notice him if he were noble. Sir Joseph is just happy that his judgment was correct. Gerger tells him that his problem is that he's arrogant. He doesn't know his place. Joseph knows this is expected since he grew up in the back alleys. Manners can be taught well if done slowly. He thinks he has the right man for for the task in front of him, leaving Gerger silent for a moment, then telling him that a disloyal sword cannot be trusted. Joseph knows all this, just bowing his head the moment he saw him won't be enough to also earn his trust. It's better to show what's inside over time, remembering Vlad telling them he has something he must do no matter what. Joseph thinks this kind of relationship where both parties want something from the other might be better. Gerger bows his head, accepting Sir Joseph's opinion. Joseph continues to explain that Vlad is not quite the wolf he seems to be. He appears arrogant, trustworthy, and full of himself, telling Gergar not to rush as it will take time to build a massive cage, a cage so large that the captured wolf mistakes it for freedom. We move to the middle of a winter night. Erte guards the night, shivering from the cold, wondering why the fog is thick in winter. He now remembers Vlad, who serves under Sir Gager, thinking he should have enchanted him early and caught his attention. By the fire, he is just grateful to be out of the expedition team in this weather. A man approaches Gera, asking if anything has happened. Gera calls him Rodak, telling him that nothing unusual has occurred. Rodak tells him to pay attention and do his job well. As he leaves, Gera tells him he understands and not to worry about them. Watching Rodak leave, Gera tells himself everything is so solid that not even a needle could penetrate, 
Realizing that since he has just patrolled, he won't return for a while, he closes his eyes and leans against the tree, wanting to rest a bit. He dozes off for a while, suddenly awakened by someone asking what he is doing here. Gera wonders if Rodak hadn't left yet. Again, he hears someone asking what it means by looking for a child. Gera looks around, wondering whom Rodak is talking to. Roderick continues to say that she's just a crazy woman, telling her that it's not her child, but suddenly he stops and doesn't finish his sentence. Gera, confused by the situation, wonders about everything from the child to why he stopped talking. After thinking for a moment, he decides to investigate the matter. He moves step by step step. After a while, he wonders where Rodok suddenly goes, as this is not the way to the camp. That's when Gera notices something wrong. He looks at Rodok, and there's a black energy surrounding him. He is terrified when he sees what it truly is, a woman's spirit, something resembling a demon near Rod's head with an ominous energy. We return to the morning after the first round of training, Vlad tending to his wounds, pained from the training and wondering if it would hurt less if they had treated him more gently. The voice tells him that this is a golden opportunity, as there is no shortage of people willing to pay to train with Yorgur. Such is his worth as a knight. To Vlad, it all seemed as if he just wanted to hit him. He is told that this makes the training match even better. After all, everyone needs motivation. Vlad doesn't comment on this and just tells him that it's somewhat sad. A man comes screaming, looking for Raymond, later saying the captain Vlad looks around but doesn't see anyone. That's when the man comes from behind a tree, Telling him to look at him, it's Gera. Vlad asks him when he returned since he thought the exploration team hadn't come back yet. Gera looks around before he speaks, ignoring his question, and tells Vlad that he is going to escape from here tonight. Vlad asks him what he is talking about. Gera tells him not to forget that he is only visiting him because of his goodwill, saying that they should meet later and have fun. Vlad wonders what kind of nonsense this is. Gera continues to explain that it's not nonsense. He saw it with his own eyes, saying that the forests they were supposed to explore are cursed. Vlad is shocked because he did not expect this and asks for more information. He continues to explain that there have been deserters until now even though the pay is great and the work environment is also good, revealing that the forests took them all. They were not deserters but missing, leaving Vlad speechless. Furthermore, he tells him that he saw it, the ghost that takes people into the forests. Vlad remains silent for a second, then explodes at Goethe, calling him a troublemaker, and that he must be joking with this. Gera continues to tell him that he is speaking the truth. Even the night disappeared yesterday. Vlad focuses a bit more and asks if it's about Sir Rodki. He confirms it, telling him that he discovered something. All the men who have disappeared so far had black hair. Time moves forward, with Gera swearing in his mind about good intent intentions, and that he should have left with his belongings alone, since he is followed by a group of mercenaries. Jorger looks at him as he walks, muttering under his breath, and asks Vlad if he can be trusted. He tells him no, but even so, he is not insane. Jorger thinks for a second. Joseph sees this as an opportunity because instead of a worthless mission, they might discover a specific direction that might be more beneficial but he is disturbed because all the missing people had black hair just like Joseph. Vlad sees this and tells him that three knights are placed in the position which suggests that something might happen. Gera just tells him that they are there because they are all useless, but he knows he cannot stay behind either. With Rod's disappearance, someone more skilled than him must step forward. Gera arrives informing Sir Jaeger that the exploration team's camp is there. A group of men welcomes Sir Jorger, introducing themselves as followers of Sir Rod. He asks them if they searched the entire forest and did not find any trace of Sir Rod. The group leader confirms this, telling him that even with leading former hunter mercenaries, they were unable to find any trace. After hearing that, Jorger knows he must check for himself, ordering the other men to search the area in groups of three, spread out as far as your eyes can see. It's sunset and Gera angrily tells Vlad that this is not right. He asks him how he could do this to him, calling him a fraudster, a scammer who exploits people's good intentions. Vlad tells him to stop chattering and focus on the search, promising him to get something later in exchange for this. Jorger asks them if they found anything. They did not and Jorger tells them that they are useless. Vlad tells him that he's from the city and asks how he found the missing people in the back alleys. Vlad reveals that it's simple. Just grab someone and beat them up, and most of the time you'll find them. Jorger realizes how bad the situation is and tells him that he is indeed useless. He knows that the sun has already set and night will come soon. He wonders if he will have to return. As he is, he looks to his side and asks if they have searched behind the river. Goethe tells them that they haven't crossed the river after all. It wasn't even in the mission's path. Jorger gathers his thoughts. There are no traces in the forest, and they have already searched it once. He knows there's no way to find Roderick or the unknown woman here. He orders Gera to gather the scattered mercenaries, 
because they will cross the river. He uses his hands and whistles, summoning the mercenaries to him. Meanwhile, Jorger walks towards the river, making sure that it's not completely frozen. Vlad tells him that this is expected because winter has ended, but it's good enough for them to get to the other side. Jorger considers Vlad's opinion, saying that dividing then crossing might actually work. The rest of the mercenaries arrive, asking if they found him. Gera tells them that they didn't find him because that's not the reason they were called for. Jorger intervenes, saying that they will expand the search area by crossing the river. It's not completely frozen, so they will divide into three groups, then cross it. The first group goes to the river and starts walking with Vlad and Gera in the back. Vlad asks Gera, what's the problem, because he's not moving forward. He tells him that he has a feeling that something is wrong. Vlad tells him to stop talking because it's just fear. Goethe tells him, of course he's scared because he's not great like people like him, revealing that someone like him has a good survival instinct, and now that's exactly what it is telling him for the last time that they shouldn't cross that river. As the sun sets, Vlad is unsure of the intuition, but sure of something else. He tells him that if he runs now, his death won't be pretty. The only witness fleeing the place will also be caught and killed, making Gerda extremely nervous and sweating profusely. Vlad tells him that's enough nonsense and to follow him, because crossing the river is his only way to survive. They step onto the frozen river, and Gerda continues to curse saying this isn't right. As he steps on the ice in panic, he asks Vlad if it could break. Vlad tells him that it certainly can break, but if he keeps babbling, he'll break the ice and leave him there by himself. He kneels, saying he just can't. Vlad starts to lift him, telling him to stand up as they're the only ones left behind. That's when Gerda looks down and starts screaming madly. Vlad, not taking him seriously at first, looks and also notices there are bodies of men under the ice. Everyone in the front turns around to see what's happening with a group of dead bodies in the river. Suddenly, the ice starts breaking under everyone. People begin to panic and move quickly towards the banks. That's when an arm of the undead breaks through the ice. All the undead from under the ice reach up, trapping the mercenaries. The men, unsure of what to do, scream for Jorger, looking for answers. He knows this is a trap, a sophisticated trap, as if they knew they were coming. With the last rays of light hitting the earth, night and darkness come, these are not the lands of the living. In the main camp inside one of the tents, the father and child pray, thanking the Lord for their protection today as well. The father asks the Lord for guidance by his light to always stay on the righteous path. Suddenly, the father starts acting strangely. The boy notices this and asks if something is wrong. That's when the father starts trembling with fear and the water in the cup in front of them starts turning black. He looks at the cup as it fills with dark energy and calls out to his god for help. That's when we look at the main camp from the perspective of a ghost approaching. The cold air follows her. She heads towards the camp in search of her child while crying, surrounded by dark energy and cold. She approaches the camp screaming, asking where her child is. We return to the river where the zombie is about to attack Goethe. He falls to the ground, screaming for help from the leader, who arrives from behind, splitting the zombie in half, saving Goethe after killing it. Vlad realizes things will be tough as more zombies flow towards them. He takes his stance, raising his sword, and cuts through them all sending severed body parts behind him as Goethe screams passing by him. That's when Vlad orders Goethe to get up and grab his spear. Goethe, scared and sitting on the ground, screams, saying he can't do it. Vlad realizes the situation is bad, as he must also protect Goethe from the zombies. The voice inside him tells him not to panic and to choose a direction before attempting to escape. He looks around, realizing he can't go forward with a massive swarm ahead, wondering if Sir Jorger is safe. More of them emerge from the ground, and Sir Jorger, surrounded by a group, raises his weapon, cutting everyone down. After finishing, he looks around, and his men scream in pain as the zombies bite them. Realizing there's no end to this, he moves forward, knowing the trap means they planned this. Not sure who said it, but their goal is clear. He gathers energy in his left eye and activates the aura as there's no time for hesitation now, with a group of zombies about to jump on him. He opens his left eye, and all of them are cut right and left before they realize. Cutting them all down boosts the morale of the men who gather together under the leadership of Sir Jorger. After he finishes his task, he screams at Vlad demanding he fulfills his contract. Vlad hears that while killing a zombie and turns around screaming at Sir Jorger, asking what he should do. He tells him to retreat to the site now and hold out as long as possible, and at any cost protect Sir Joseph according to the contract. Vlad knows what he must do and starts moving, telling Gerda to get up and follow him while he screams at him to wait. Sir Jorger prays to the Lord above for those who follow his will to reach Sir Joseph safely. He hears a voice behind him, turns around, and sees who it is, and apologizes for being late. It's Sir Rotk and a group of zombies approaching him. At the sight, Sir Joseph sits in his tent reading a book, becoming alert as he hears screams outside his tent. Through the sounds, he wonders if it's an attack as men outside are screaming at something to get away from them. Gordon arrives at his tent, a leader from the days of suppressing the hobgoblins 
Sir Joseph asks him what the chaos is about. Gordon catches his breath and can't utter more than a word. Joseph gets angry at him, wondering if he really came to him without even checking the situation. Gordon comes up with more excuses, telling the young lord that his safety is the utmost priority. Joseph yells at him angrily, wondering how his safety is the utmost priority if he didn't even arm himself with a sword. Gordon stops for a moment and looks to his side where his sword should be and realizes it's not there. Joseph tells him how lucky he is because if it were him, he would have hung him on the spot. Gordon bows his head, asking for forgiveness. More men enter the tent with the father. Joseph is pleased to see Father Andreas enter directly to ask him if he knows what's happening. Here, the father interrupts him and tells him it's evil, asking him to come closer and take a look at this. It's written in the Bible with holy ink. He looks at it and sees the writing trembling like a leaf in a storm, realizing this is not ordinary, and asks the father if there's a way to stop it. Here, the father tells him he's not an exorcist, but promises to unleash as much of his divine power as possible. However, even with the presence of such an evil being, it might not prove very useful. Joseph understands the situation they're in. One of the remaining knights had created their own worlds, but now they are their only options. He steps forward, telling the rest of the men to start moving. He leaves the tent first and sees what's happening, wondering why there's fog. All the men are screaming in pain, hallucinating and rolling on the ground, screaming that they are not her sons. Suddenly, Joseph covers his mouth with a cloth so as not to inhale the fog. He asks the father if the fog makes people hallucinate. The father covers his mouth with his arm and tells him the only thing he's sure of is that this is not a natural phenomenon. Joseph realizes the fog has also reached them. This is when everyone freezes in fear as the ghost calls out searching for her child. She wanders beside them, looking forward, asking where her child is. Everyone is surprised and frozen in fear to see the evil ghost for the first time, unable to speak. They watch the ghost in front of them move and suddenly turns to them, asking if her child is there. She turns and sees Joseph. Here she screams, saying that she has finally found her child and heads towards them, making Joseph feel uneasy. The evil ghost's arm emerges from nowhere, trying to reach Joseph, but is suddenly stopped by some kind of light, burning her hand. She tries to advance, but the light rays burn her hands. She screams attempting to move towards Joseph. It's the fathers and young boys pouring a barrier around the group, protecting them from the evil ghost. Meanwhile, Joseph thinks, wondering if there isn't another way besides waiting to confront the ghost George, while Katie and Maxim, unable to do so, lie on the ground defeated. Even with the exceptional blessing from priest Andreas, they were unable to bring down the enemy. The evil ghost stands behind the barrier, burning her hands and screaming at Joseph, claiming that he is her child. Joseph looks at the situation and realizes that this is a curse a spiteful curse aimed at him, wondering who on earth could have orchestrated this. Suddenly, the young boy assisting Father Andreas in maintaining the barrier coughs up blood. The father calls out to Jean to hold on, telling him that the son will find its way to him. Her hand begins to emerge from the barrier. That's when Jean, coughing up blood, begins to pray again to maintain the barrier, pushing the evil out of the barrier once more. Joseph looks at him, realizing he has reached his limit, knowing that the hymns will soon stop, wondering if this is the end as the night is too long to wait for tomorrow's sun. While he is thinking, he sees someone. It's Vlad with his sword approaching the ghost from behind. She notices him and turns her face towards him. That's when Vlad raises his sword covered in blue energy, ready to cut off her head. We go back a bit in time before Vlad rushes to chase the evil ghost. The voice reveals that she is driven by a curse and that a normal sword cannot cut her at all. If that's the case, Vlad asks what they should do if his sword cannot reach her. The voice asks him if he can use the aura now. Vlad, hiding behind some cover, tells him if he's joking with him. He stops talking for a moment, telling Vlad that there is one way. Vlad directly asks what it is, and the voice tells him to allow it to borrow his body for a while. Vlad wonders if that's even possible, but the voice knows it can use the aura, but isn't sure if it can manifest it inside his body. Even if it succeeded, he wouldn't be able to move for a while. Frankly, it doesn't recommend this for Vlad. However, Vlad knows that if he can't kill her, she will kill him. The voice tells him that this is the way of the sword. As Vlad grips the sword's handle tightly, he remains silent for a second, then tells the voice to do it. The voice hesitates but says, with a determined look in his eyes, that he made a promise to Joseph. Since he has something he must do, he will dedicate himself not by loyalty, but by faith. The voice respects his choice, and we return to the present as Vlad rushes toward the evil ghost. The ghost releases a horrendous scream that throws Vlad off rhythm, but then the voice tells him to suddenly close his right eye. Suddenly, something like lightning strikes him, wrapped in blue energy, calling this the realm of sounds. He opens his right eye, revealing the blue energy that wraps the sword, and advances toward the ghost. The ghost is completely affected by the release of energy, making it easy for Vlad to move and slice her in half, leaving all remaining forces on sight speechless. Once he completes the move, 
He falls to his knees screaming in pain, a reaction running through his entire body because this power is not his yet. Joseph, worried, screams at him as he crawls on the ground in pain. He realizes that those were definitely the effects of the aura just now, not knowing how he did it, but he did, sure that he paid a high price for it. The ghost hasn't recovered, but her severed upper half tries to reach Vlad on the ground. Joseph steps forward, leaving the barrier, telling the father not to stop the chance. He reaches Vlad and helps him stand, trying to get him to a safe place. While the ghost calls Joseph her child, she manages to grab his foot, forcing him to kneel. He gets angry at himself for being so weak, unable to get out of this situation. That's when Forden grabs the young master by his coat, apologizing for his impudence as he throws them towards the barrier. The ghost screams madly as her child slips from her grasp. They land safely, and the father is happy they are now safe. Joseph tells Forden that this is the first time he is glad to have him by his side. Vlad regains some of his strength and stands, telling the father to bless his sword as they must send this woman off. He stays silent for a second, then grasps his sword and cuts his hand, telling Vlad it's a profound blessing. Vlad takes the sword and thanks him. The father prays for his safety as he leaves to end the evil. Vlad approaches the upper body of the ghost, who pleads with him to help her find her child. Vlad empathizes with the woman while recalling the memory he saw for a moment when he was approaching her. The women were trapped in a dark prison, screaming behind bars for their children while their young ones lay in front of them on the cold ground, begging from behind the bars to have her child return to her. In this woman's horrific memories, she wails as her child freezes to death before her eyes. Vlad lifts his sword with a sad look on his face and tells her to rest in peace. She still asks where her child is as Vlad stabs her with his sword. The ghost turns back into a woman with tears falling down her cheeks, still asking about her child as the sun begins to rise. Vlad kneels before her as it all ends. Elsewhere in the forest, a violet energy gathers. A man sits with a box in front of him, extending his hands and maintaining some sort of dark spell above it. He smiles, thinking everything is going well. Suddenly, the spell he was trying to maintain begins to dissipate, and after a second, the spell is lifted and the man realizes the evil machinations have stopped. He wonders if someone has already defeated the ghost. If so, who on earth did it? He claims they told him for sure that there was only one one knight who knew how to use the aura. As he sits behind some sort of rock in the forest, suddenly, a voice comes out of nowhere saying that, as he thought, he has finally managed to locate him, the rat controlling the puppet. It's Sir Jagger standing on top of the rock behind the man who was controlling the ghost. We return to the main camp with Sir Joseph, asking Jagger if he was responsible for the entire incident, the one controlling death from the shadows. Jagger, holding his head with one hand and the box with the other, tells him that it seems so for now. Joseph notices the box, realizing it must be the the cursed body that the woman from last night was searching for. The box itself has become the child's coffin. Jagger orders it to be handed over to the priest. They will investigate the matter when they return to Varna. Both of them look over the main camp, with Sir Joseph knowing this mission was a complete failure. Jagger regrettably has to agree with him. Joseph acknowledges it as a failure, but he knows they will return with enlightening steps. Jagger asks him if Vlad was of any help. He smiles and tells him it seems he found him the person who will replace him as the sword, that boy will be a swordsman shining brighter than anyone. We return to Vlad, who wakes up confused, wondering if he had been unconscious for three consecutive days. The voice confirms it and tells him he will need to be more careful next time. He didn't know the backlash would be this severe. For Vlad, it's still a relief. He thought they would wrap things up in the camp and return immediately, without waiting for him to wake up. He begins to rise from the bed, and the voice tells him that they were waiting for him to recover, revealing to Vlad that the man named Joseph cared for him a lot. He steps out of the tent and looks around, realizing, of course, that the camp is deserted. Everyone would leave after what happened. Jira appears out of nowhere, happy to see the leader awake, asking him if he knows how worried he was. Vlad smiles, noting how the person who spoke of running away stayed until the end. Jira tells him that, of course, he stayed. They promised a bonus for those who remain until they return, wondering if he knows that he brought him back to the camp when he couldn't even ride a horse and return to danger for the Night Lord, telling Vlad to make sure he makes him look good later. Vlad waves him off, saying he will try. Jira tells him that Sir Jer expects him to report as soon as he wakes up. Also, Sir Joseph is in the barracks now, telling Vlad to hurry over there. Vlad listens to him and starts moving towards the barracks, telling him he did a good job as he leaves. Jira waves to him and shouts, reminding him not to forget to tell them. Vlad prays to God to make him be quiet. He reaches Sir Joseph's barrack while he is pouring wine into his glass. Vlad asks if he can drink the wine. Vlad tells him that he can at the end of the day. He worked in brotherhoods in the past, but he never drank fine wine like this. Joseph, smiling, 
looks at the bottle telling him this is a noble's drink. He looks at Vlad and thanks him for what he did, because he could have simply run away. Vlad asks him if they didn't have a contract. Joseph tells him they did, as he promised him faith instead of loyalty. He knows the contract was just words, yet he fulfilled it. It is a talent he cannot afford to lose. He thinks for a moment and realizes it is a talent he must possess. He puts down the wine glass, telling Vlad that now is the time to fulfill his part of the contract, rewarding him according to his achievement this time, formally inviting Vlad to join House Bazid. Vlad is completely surprised they move to Varna, Bazid province, after returning from the mission. Sir Jagger tells Joseph that he has dismissed the mercenaries who stayed with them till the end, telling him he did a good job and that the report on the mission is still pending, so they will have to stay here for a day or two. Behind them, Vlad looks left and right inspecting the city. Sir Jagger asks him if this is his first time here. Vlad, born in the poor neighborhoods, tells him that no matter where he goes, it will always be his first time there. Sir Jagger closes his eyes and calls him a villager. Sir Joseph tells him to take a day off today and wander around the city if so. Vlad bows his head, thanking his new lord. Sir Jagger leaves him telling him not to get lost and to be at the city hall by dusk. Vlad watches their backs as they leave, thinking about how much he hates Sir Jer. The voice inside his head tells him that Sir Jer loves him as much as Joseph does. Vlad scoffs at this, saying if he loved him more, he might come to take his life next time, quickly forgetting about this when he remembers the large reward for the mission, telling himself that he will have a hearty meal after a long time. Wondering what's good here, someone approaches him, holding his hand, calling him Mr. Vlad. He turns around and sees that it's the father, asking him if there's something. The father tells him if he doesn't have any specific plans for the day, then the priest would like to invite him. Vlad, unsure of who the priest is, takes the chance and goes. Arriving in front of the massive church, Vlad is astonished by its size, where even the churches in Sora were not this big. The father tells him that's because while the city of Storma is the capital of the Bizd province, the city of Varna is considered the religious center, asking Vlad to wait inside for a while, and he will bring the priest soon. Vlad enters, amazed. Everything is shining, and the main light is in yellow and orange. After a second, he realizes that despite the name, he has never properly prayed even once, making him feel uncomfortable as if he has committed a sin. Meanwhile, a priest enters, apologizing for making him wait. Vlad bows his head, telling him he did not, thanking him for the invitation. The priest laughs, touched, and tells him not to mention such a thing. He leans forward and hands Vlad a piece of wood of some kind. Vlad realizes what it is, but before he can say anything, the priest tells him it's his identification symbol, telling Vlad that he knows Lord Joseph would have managed fine on his own, but he's sure that the identification symbols from the church are the most effective. After all, the Lord's care extends across the entire continent. Vlad is surprised while reading what is written on the symbol when he notices that the guarantor is Priest Andreas. The father holds him by the shoulder, telling him to come to look for him whenever he needs because from this moment on, he is his guarantor. Vlad realizes the importance of this matter and immediately kneels down. A boy from the slums, who couldn't even register his birth, with this sincere guarantor in front of him, has his name written in the wide world and from today onwards, Vlad is no longer from the slums, but he is Vlad from Sora. A caravan of wagons and troops led by Sir Jaeger, Vlad, and Sir Joseph travels across the lands. The province of Bezde itself encompasses 12 towns and three cities, one of which is the distribution center Sora, and the next is the religious center Varna, where Vlad received his identification symbol from the priest. And finally, Sir Joseph points ahead to Vlad, telling him that this is the last city on the list, the capital city Storma. They enter the city through the main gate and head straight to the headquarters. Sir Jaeger warns Jira and Vlad that they are now guests of Lord Joseph, demanding they keep this in mind and not do anything foolish that could harm Lord Joseph's reputation further, asking them to stay put and not run around like madmen. He wants to tell them that when the maids bring refreshments, they should do something, but suddenly stops, and Vlad and Jira wonder why he didn't finish his sentence. Sir changes his mind and instead tells them not to eat anything and just wait, as they would end up fueling bad rumors if they ate like barbarians. He starts walking away when Vlad tries to tell him a little, won't hurt anyone, but he is interrupted by Sir Jaeger telling him to shut up and not eat anything. They open the door to the room and are dazzled by the luxury, everything shiny reflecting light from the chandelier, and Jira comments that Bezdez really are the real deal. Both of them look forward as someone calls out saying he hasn't seen them before. The man who was hiding behind the curtains becomes annoyed as he was just trying to be stealthy and have fun there. He comes out from behind the curtain approaching Vlad and Jira. Vlad and the man exchange looks, and in that moment, Vlad's eyes light up, realizing who this man is. On the other hand, the man standing before them wonders who they are. Vlad, with a concerned look in his eyes, 
knows the appearance is somewhat familiar, but his aura is on a completely different level, with a fierce look on his face as if he could split someone in half just by looking at them. Jira introduces himself first, telling the man that they accompanied Lord Joseph on the mission. The man stops him from speaking and looks at Vlad waiting for him to introduce himself. Vlad just tells him he's Vlad from Sora. The man tells him it's the first time he's heard this name, pondering over Vlad, realizing he has fierce eyes, and since he doesn't back down in the slightest fear, wonders how confident he is even in his presence, thinking that Joseph might have found a very useful person, and admiring Vlad so far. He reaches into his pocket and offers the guest some peanuts. Vlad looks at him for a moment, then looks up, informing him that they were told not to eat anything. When the man is surprised by this, Vlad repeats it again, astonishing Jira as well. Gira wonders how Vlad could refuse the goodwill of a high-ranking individual in such a manner, questioning if he is mad. The man is embarrassed with a blank look on his face. This is Vlad's first act in the Bazid house, refusing the peanuts peanuts offered by Rodiger, the eldest count's son. Jira's spirit leaves his body from this, and the man stands in front of them eating the peanuts himself, telling them they are indeed delicious. Mr. Joseph speaks with his father in his office. Joseph mentions that he has brought Vlad back from Sora. The father is pleased with the news since they had no notable person except Guayer, who was brought by Joseph's mother. The father tells Joseph that if he can raise the boy to become a good knight like the knights of their family, he will also be rewarded. Joseph bows and thanks his father for the opportunity, but his father warns Joseph that he understands the sword is not his strong point, but he should never forget that he is a Bazid. Joseph remains steadfast and agrees to everything. The father wonders if he is feeling better now after the incident. When Joseph tells him he is and addresses him as, Sir, his father tells him he can leave now. Joseph wishes him a good night and leaves the room. The father looks at him as he exits the door and notices some abnormalities in his walk. After Joseph leaves, the father tells his advisor that they need to get some medicine for him. The advisor is sure that this will please him as well as his mother, Lady Oksana. The father knows that his mother deeply cares for her children, then asks his advisor Ragas about his opinion on Joseph's report. He tells him they must take it seriously because strange things are happening one after the other. The father is angry because they must find out who is behind all this, wondering how they dare commit such wicked acts on his land. Ragas also reveals that reports have come from Varna, apparently. It's a cunning mix of reviving the dead and curse techniques that made the dead alive. They believe it's the work of either the main dark wizard or more than one dark wizard. The father comments that if there are more than two of them, it could be a group or organization. Ragas confirms that this might be the case, but the father knows that it changes nothing, as the house of Bazid will stand here forever, immovable. He walks to the door and tells Ragas that they are ready to do anything to eliminate those who dare stand in their way, giving Ragas a serious look, wishing to find them soon, those who dared to endanger his son and create chaos in his land. We move to midnight at the headquarters. Joseph and Jurger enter the room where they left Vlad and Gira. Joseph tells them that the report took longer than expected, wondering if they waited too long. Goethe speaks first, telling them they didn't wait at all. Joseph turns to him, asking if he is Jira. Jira, all happy to know the rewards of his work, feels disappointed when Joseph tells him they will talk about it tomorrow, telling him the maid will show him his room where he can rest. Disappointed, he leaves the room, saying goodbye to everyone. Joseph sits in the chair and tells Vlad to talk with him a little, telling him that he saved his life and has decided to dedicate his sword to him for the future, wondering if this is true. Vlad tells him yes, sir, and remains silent. Joseph asks him additionally if he needs freedom to complete the task he must undertake. Vlad admits this. Joseph tells him that Vlad told him he would dedicate his sword to him, but his desire for freedom conflicts with this, telling him they need to be clear about this. Joseph asks him what exactly he plans to do with his freedom, because if he can tell him about that, he can precisely determine what he needs to give him. Vlad looks at him, shadowing the silence for a second. Both look at each other. This is when Vlad asks if he knows Gudin from Jar, the night resembling the blue moonlight.